I was just, uh, I just, uh, I was very fortunate, I was very flattered, I heard I was supposed to be given the plenary address at the Society for Critical Care Medicine uh, next year, and I was going back, my first time I attended it, I, they asked me to give a talk, and I said, the earlier the intervention, the better the results. And it's kind of interesting because here we are uh, having the same kind of talk today. And uh, so things are more, what did Dwight Eisenhower say once? Uh, things are more the same today than they ever have been, you know, that kind of thing. So this is an is a issue of affecting the neurological outcome. The things that he just talked about, how did that play out when we did an intervention? And again, um, you know, again, I'm sorry because we keep going patting each other on our back, but that's one of the reasons why I came to work with Paul, because it was worth the investment to have people and him and Chief Vitone are just really go-getters out there that are respected by the troops and all things I talked about in that last uh, session out there. And then, of course, our, um, the, the queen of the night here, you know, who's been uh, terrific in the data collection that you guys have been doing there. And uh, so I really appreciate all the help. Got to give you credit. So uh, if, for those, I'm sorry for the, those who saw my talk earlier today, I uh, apologize. I don't have to go through this again. But um, there are four inevitabilities of life, uh, death, taxes, and, of course, kale, okay? But there's also disclosures. And the main thing is that I am an old guy, as I showed you here before. But the other thing is I was a child once, too, so I do have a conflict of interest here, right? So that's about it, though. All right, so let's move on. My poor attempt at humor, so that's the old guy stuff. This is not going to be a podcast. It's just me giving an old-timey lecture, so here we go. So what's the conventional wisdom? And we just said that. Uh, we scoop and run, generally, has been the approach. Why? What are the reasons why we've had grim outcomes? Paul's already explained that to you. And what are the things, I'm going to reinforce what they do. We, including me, don't use my PD ALS skills regularly, okay? Even if I'm in the PD ED, I'm not using them that regularly either. So it's intimidating for most rescuers, not just the paramedics, let alone think about them, right? And then there's a volatile setting with the families going, please get them to the hospital right away. And you're going, uh, 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 you know, so there's that stuff. I mean, and it's, it is. And, you know, you don't want to let them down. Uh, the whole guilt stuff starts coming out. So it's, it's a real challenge, okay? And the psychological issue. And then guess what? Kids are easy to carry, so let's do it. Let's just go. So that has evolved into us in a scoop and run mode, and that's what goes wrong in the United States. This is not, that doesn't mean that the protocol changed. They're still following PALS or the Heart Association guidelines or whatever it is. <laughs> It's just that they're delaying the care, and that was the whole emphasis that Paul was trying to make there, okay? So in addition, the conventional wisdom has been don't innovate because of some studies that were done uh, over the years, and they're saying, oh, the kids had worse outcomes when they got innovated. Well, the problem was that it's very complicated, that whole thing, but if you have the right system, innovation is actually a good thing to do, and I certainly want it done on my kid, but I want it to be in the right system. Here's what I'm saying. For example, if you had where the main study that was done back in the 90s in LA County, they had 2,600 paramedics that were trained. And over the course of the first year, for example, they innovated 125 kids. So that means they get to do it once every 20 years. And if your partner gets one, maybe the odds of you getting one is every 40 years. So you have to stay around EMS to get a PD innovation. You got my drift. You don't use the skills enough. So the two systems where I worked in, and uh, Paul was familiar with this, had what we call a tiered response, where we had a small cadre of paramedics. For example, in Seattle, back in the 70s, I only had four medic units, a total of maybe 60 medics, uh, who were going to do 2,000 to 3,000 intubations a year. All the basic, 90% of what we do in EMS is basic life support. So in this, we kept these guys available for the cases in which they were really needed. And the other thing is we taught them right. We didn't teach them just how to do it in the OR. We went down and we're in the streets with them and telling them how to do things that even don't worry about suction, just get the tube in, you know, and get the head up into a sniffing position, et cetera. So we spent a lot of time making sure they were trained right. And some of our, our veterans were so good at it that they can turn most of the innovations over to the, the, the rookies right away. So they're getting their 100 innovations in within a year and they were really good at it. And so I won't go, the point is, if you ask me, is innovation good? Absolutely, especially for kids. But you better have this in place, 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 and this in place. If you don't, then it may not be good. So, so but the point is, overall, we want to know, don't throw the baby out of the bathwater. There is actually a place for it, but you've got to have the right system set up, and that's what they did, okay? So we're going to go on to that. The other thing is the respiratory costs. So you've got to breathe a lot. Well, that means they don't understand the physiology. And the physiology is such that oxygenation is more a case of FiO2 inspired oxygen to some extent if there's a mismatch of VQ, but more importantly, it's lung inflation. So, for example, if I have 
lung areas that have collapsed, particularly if I'm doing compressions or whatever, or anybody, I can ventilate as fast as I want, okay, and blow off CO2, but it doesn't inflate the lung. It doesn't oxygenate there. Those are the, that will be shunt, huge shunt. The most important thing to do is to keep the lung in an inflated state. That's why we use PEEP in people who have ARDS or whatever. You try to inflate, overinflate areas or just maybe re-recruit some areas that have been closed off. So our experience has been to just sort of get a good lung inflation, probably only need to do that by giving a breath once every, you know, five or six times a minute, especially with CPR going on. And in kids, they have pretty good lungs, so they're compliant, so they can take it and, and so on. You know, the whole issue about um, causing barotrauma has to do with prolonged stuff over a period of time with people who already have, uh, how would you say, heterogeneous lung disease like ARDS. You're overstretching some areas on top of PEEP, you know, that kind of thing. But when you take a uh, regular lung, like when I take a breath like this, that's about five liters. And we're talking about here, for example, in an adult, you could probably get away with giving them eight or 900 to inflate the lungs. And, but the thing is, that's a more efficient breath, but you just don't give it that. You gotta keep intrathoracic pressure down. So maybe one breath every 10 seconds, like he was saying, is physiologically some. And when you're in a low perfusion state, you're not producing CO2. And even if you are, it's not coming back to the lungs, so you don't have to ventilate, okay? And everybody kind of knows that now. And this, we were having a hard time selling this back in the 80s because we didn't have entire CO2. Now people are kind of getting it. They're seeing what's happening because they're seeing, ah, it has to do with blood flow. Yeah, exactly. So you get my point? So the point is good lung inflation, but no rapid ventilation. Keep the positive pressure down in the chest. We had probably been killing kids by, you know, it's been death by hyperventilation because we thought that that was the important thing to do. I mean, so. I don't, I'm not critical, it's just that's, you got to understand the physiology better. So they took it to heart, and this becomes important because in their thing, they were so disciplined, and I have to give them credit because you have to be disciplined. You got a kid, and there's that temptation. You watch your respiratory therapist, they have a temptation to want to do that. So you really got to be disciplined, and we had people watching, and they did a good job of that. They controlled it. All right. So you routinely see in most systems that they're given breaths more than six per minute, et cetera, and particularly when I get into, when I see a respiratory therapist taking over, it's just weird. And then the first dose of epi is delayed. Anybody had your how much delayed it is? And let's say from the time you arrive on the scene, when you should you have the epi on board? Yeah, just logistically, you're setting up, you're getting IVs out, you're, yeah, whatever, that kind of thing, right? So I'll take you through that and I'll show you how that worked. And then, oops. They're, I think they're trying to get me on the internet here. Let me know the password. I got to find out the password. <laughs> I get, I'll close it up. All right. How, how are we doing on time? Because I, I should wrap up in about two minutes, I think. Yeah. Okay. So, what would happen if we go, and this is the question he was just taking you through. A neurologically intact route could be improved by deferring the transport using strategies that emphasize on scene drug delivery innovation with tightly controlled ventilation and then training with supportive psychological components strategies to deal with the families who are going, please get him there, get him there, okay? It's tough. And he knows better about what happened in that case, but they did do specialized training in that area to help him do that. I already described the system that he's in and the tools uh, that they had at Registry well in place. And throughout, remember, this is 2012 to current. It was using the 2010 guidelines of what we were using throughout all this, et cetera. And interestingly enough, even when we're scoop and run, we're using the same thing. It's just that we're not doing it right away, right? Paul makes a great argument about let's get it done right now. So what did we do? So here what happened here is that uh, interventions were limited scene time. Now we prioritized it. Expedited drug delivery dur during direct IO and innovation with controlled ventilatory rates. Modified training included the psychological and skills enhancing tools to provide greater confidence in providing on-scene care and how to deal with the people who are like, you know, freaking out. It's a volatile scene. And then 2016 is, is that we started preparing. We said, hey, you know, if you can, you know how old the kid is. If you hear they're five years old, we'll get, you know, whatever out, 0.4 milligrams or 0.3 milligrams. It doesn't even matter if it's 0.3 or 0.4, but, I mean, you got the ballpark. You don't have to sweat getting the tape out and all that. You just you use system one thinking. Does anybody know what system one thinking is? Like, if you're going, set it 50 times 50, you go, yeah, 2,500. 55 times 55, go, okay, you got to recalculate. So that's what happens when we're doing the 0.05 and it's kilograms and it's whatever, pounds. So it just, if I know going in, it's a nine-year-old and I'm going to get 0.5, it's straightforward. So in the second phase of change, we actually started preparing things in route to the scene. Because uh, the first dose is going to be the epi, so let's just get the epi out and have it ready to go.
Okay? You'll see why that happened and why I think that's important. There were no other relevant modifications made. So we're looking at neurointact survival. We were comparing to when we got stuff on scene and later as we're pairing the drugs in route on top of that. All right, so what are the results? Anybody want to know? <laughs> so here we go. Cruz had 143 cases over the 5.3 years before we submitted the abstract, all right? And then among the resuscitated patients, the time to interval from medic on scene to the first dose epi shrank from, get that, 16 and a half minutes from the time we arrived on scene. And that means we were going off, getting on, then we were getting it out and measuring tapes or whatever, right? To 7.3. And guess what happened when we started preparing it in route? Point five, five, point 5 minutes from arrival of scene. So that's 300 seconds, but even better, that's going down way under the five minutes now. You guys are getting better at it. So we're gonna see what happens next. Successful intubation, I were regularly performed in much greater frequency on the scene, et cetera, but no other significant difference were found in age, sex, etiology. I think our bystander CPR rate went up maybe 45 to 55 or something, but that was not statistically significant. It's not a lot of numbers here, that's why. And the outcome envelope, please, here's what happened. So. Our ROSC, getting pulses back, getting him to the hospital alive, is in this sort of lime green color here. Two of 38 were resuscitated, kids. No survivors. And you'll see now the red showing up. Red is, that's who survived neurologically intact. So in the next phase, we started play, staying and playing on scene. Look what happens is the resuscitation rate goes up, but the most importantly is that the neuro attack survival goes up dramatically. And then look what happens now when you get the drug prepared before you get there. And here's what happens now. It's going up from 23% survival, neurologically intact, to 35%. Now, I have to admit, these are historical controls, and other things could be changing that period of time. But the things that I think changed were two things. One is the troops were getting more excited, and they felt like they could deal with it better, and they were performing better, and they were getting more used to it, and they were just doing it better, I think. That's part of it. And we're just fine-tuning what we were doing before. Regardless of all that, this is, what's hap this is what was happening before, and that's what's happening across the United States, and no matter what caused this in all this, that's it. But one of the things we think caused it, and one of the biggest uh, drivers was this, 16 and a half minutes to the first epi, 7.3 to 5, okay? Again, I, those are just correlations, and they're correlations. They can't, you can't prove it, but uh, the whole point is that we're driving things earlier, and the earlier the intervention, the better results. Okay, so let's move on. The conclusions for me is that even though it's a historically controlled study, the sudden and really dramatic appearance of non neuro intact survivors was profound, immediate, and very rewarding. And the reason why that becomes important because now everybody's like pumped, let's keep doing this, and they do better, and they're getting better at it. And we actually learned as we're going along the way, much as is attributable to the techniques that expedited care and a disciplined focus on physiologically sound respiratory management and system one thinking and rapid medication dosing. Those are the keys, okay? And then I wanna add this in. My conclusion from this too is having observed these guys is that the major contributions were the supportive encouragement from the leadership. Just, just it's profound, okay? And then the training with the specialized psychological tools, which I was asked about, Paul, in the last meeting and I really couldn't explain because I wasn't there when you guys were doing this. Um, and then reinforced encouragement from the success itself. That's, that drives a lot right there, okay? And you have new confidence that you can do it. Now, on the road to the 2020s, I think that you'll find that the dead shall be raised, that we didn't get back, and we'll make life better for future generations. So thank you very much for paying attention to that one, okay? Cool.